Homer Price, Chapter 6, Wheels of Progress. I can't go fishing today, Freddy, said Homer, because I'm helping Uncle Ulysses down at the lunchroom. Seems as though the fish ought to be biting on a day like this. Do you think your Uncle Ulysses could use an extra helper today, Homer? Because it is an imperative that I have to go fishing. I just thought, if you weren't busy. Gosh, Freddy, Uncle Ulysses would like it. He always says, the more help, the merrier. But Aunt Aggie is, too many cooks in the kitchen spoils the soup sort of person. And she says she's sick and tired of seeing more people behind the counter than in front of it. Okay, Homer, said Freddy with a sigh. I'll see you tomorrow. Bring me a couple of donuts if you can. When Homer entered the lunchroom, there was Uncle Ulysses puttering with one of his labor-saving devices. Hello, Homer, he said. You're just in time to help me adjust the timing mechanism in this electric toaster. When you want the toast to come out light brown, it comes out nut brown and vice versa. Homer and Uncle Ulysses tinkled with the toaster and then tried several pieces of toast. Then they tinkered with the mechanism some more. Hey, how is the donut machine working these days, Uncle Ulysses asked Homer. Just fine, said Uncle Ulysses. We're selling more donuts than ever. And with that new recipe, I suppose you've heard about the lady who gave us that old family recipe, the lady who lost her bracelet in the batter? Well, she lives in Centerburg now. She's Naomi Enders, a great, great, great granddaughter of Ezekiel Enders, the first settler of Centerburg. Why, she inherited all of the Enders' property when old Luke Enders died. She owns the mill and the patent medicine company now, and she's living in the big Enders homestead at the edge of town. She stops by for donuts almost every day, and she's one of my best customers, she is. Yep, said Homer. The judge mentioned that she had come to live in Centerburg. Why, he said that she was a public-spirited person, and we'd be an addition to the town. She appreciates good food, said Uncle Ulysses, tasting a piece of nut brown toast. And what's more, she has a receptive mind, receptive to the new devices and to up and coming ideas. A car stopped out front and Uncle Ulysses peered out and said, well, here she comes now, Homer. Better start packing two dozen donuts for takeout to her. Good afternoon, Miss Enders. Hello, Homer. I haven't seen you since the night my bracelet disappeared, she said. Hello, Miss Enders, said Homer. How do you like living in Centerburg? I think it's a marvelous town. Simply marvelous, replied Miss Enders. I've been thinking of what I could do to show my appreciation for the way the people of Centerburg have received me. Everyone has been so kind. Simply marvelous. I've just been talking to the judge, and he has informed me that there is a growing housing shortage and that people are having difficulty finding places to live. I've decided that a nice way of showing my appreciation would be to build a few homes on my family property. Why, they could be replicas of the Enders Homestead of a sort monument, and I could rent them reasonably to deserving families. Mmm, said Uncle Ulysses, stroking his chin. Good idea, Miss Enders, good idea. Homer agreed, and while he counted out two dozen donuts, he thought of the fun there would be walking rafters and joists as the new homes were built. Uncle Ulysses stopped stroking his chin and said, I tell you, Miss Enders, it wouldn't do any harm to have more modern houses here in Homestead. Of course, said Miss Enders, modern plumbing. Uncle Ulysses went back to stroking his chin and saying, hmm, and modern kitchen equipment, said Miss Enders, as she thought she knew that would bring instant approval from Uncle Ulysses. Uh-huh, said Uncle Ulysses, and stroked his chin from left to right. Finally, he cleared his throat and said, These are changing times, Miss Enders, and we're living in an age of ideas and production genius. Now take the way they used to make donuts, for instance, each one cooked by hand and all that time and bother. Well, now we have this wonderful machine. Makes donuts just like that, said Uncle Ulysses, snapping his fingers. Snap, snap, snap. It's marvelous, said Miss Enders, simply marvelous. Mm-hmm, continued Uncle Ulysses. Now take the matter of houses, he said. The way they used to build houses. Saw up each board, hammer in a nail one at a time. Every little shingle and doorknob fastened by hand. 
But now, said Uncle Ulysses, with the up and coming ideas and the modern production genius, houses can be built just like this. Here machine makes donuts. And he made a broad sweep with his right arm. That's the principle, pronounced Uncle Ulysses, while Miss Enders and Homer gazed in wide-eyed wonder. That's the principle that Henry Ford applied to making autos. Yep, autos are mass produced, just like my donuts. Ships are built like donuts, airplanes and refrigerators, and now houses. Yes siree, the modern house ought to be mass produced, just like a car or a ship or a plane. Yes siree, mass produced, just like that there machine makes donuts. And right here, Uncle Ulysses snapped his fingers, snap, 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 and said, Houses just like that, snap. He then stopped waving his arms and talking and appeared startled that he had talked so much and with so much wisdom. He started stroking his chin again, looking pondering at Miss Enders, quite visibly impressed, and she was murmuring, marvelous, simply marvelous. Homer counted the two dozen donuts again. Of course, said Uncle Ulysses, it wouldn't be quite as fast or easy as making donuts but with assembly lines and sub-assembly lines and power presses and a touch of ingenuity, that's your recipe. I bet you could bake a house in 24 hours flat. Snap! Build, corrected Homer. Simply marvelous, said the receptive Miss Enders. Simply marvelous. Homer had heard Uncle Ulysses' pet theories before, and the sheriff and the boys over at the barber shop all had heard Uncle Ulysses carry on about all these up-and-coming ideas he had. In fact, arguing about Uncle Ulysses' pet theories had broken up as many pinochle and checker games as arguing about the World Series and women's suffrage put together. That was all that ever happened, though, arguing. But that afternoon in the lunchroom was different. Miss Enders was receptive to Uncle Ulysses' up-and-comingness, and what's more, she had the money to be receptive and up-and-coming with. Almost before the week was up, Miss Enders and the judge, who was her lawyer, and Uncle Ulysses were having conferences. They wrote letters to Detroit, where they have assembly lines and sub-assembly lines and huge presses that can stamp out the whole side of a house, just as easy as stamping out the body of a car or a section of a ship. Where they hired up-and-coming designers and landscape architects, too. Almost before she knew it, Miss Enders had made arrangements for 100 houses, a whole suburb to be built on the estate around the Enders homestead. As Uncle Ulysses so wisely put it, it don't pay to go all through the trouble of mixing batter and getting the machine hot for two or three donuts. Might as well just make a hundred while you're at it. Well, the plans were finally finished with the arrangements all made. The workmen arrived at the Enders estate and then things really began to happen. The trees were chopped down and hauled away. The land was leveled by huge tractors and streets were laid out around the old homestead in a day or two. Then power diggers arrived right on schedule and dug one foundation right after another. Homer drove over to the suburb with Uncle Ulysses and Miss Enders to see how things were going. Uncle Ulysses watched the dirt fly and counted as the machines dug foundations. 72, 73, 74. I tell you, my boy, he said to Homer, you are witnessing the beginning of a new era in city planning and housing. 81, 82, why tomorrow they'll start to build and by the end of the week, there will be people living here. Simply marvelous, exclaimed Miss Enders, simply marvelous. Just think, last week there was only grass and trees and squirrels on this spot. Well, everything happened right on schedule, just as Uncle Ulysses had predicted. Huge trucks and trailers drove along the streets, unloading subassembled sides and floors and roofs of houses, all complete to the last window, doorknobs, light bulbs, hot and cold water. Well, it was just a matter of an hour or so for the workers to fasten the sides and floors together and put the roof on a house. As the Centerburg newspaper said in its editorial, truly, we are witnessing a modern miracle. Little did Ezekiel Enders know when he founded this town 150 years ago that such things as this would come to pass. The Centerburg Bugle is sponsoring the 150 Years of Centerburg Progress Week to be celebrated when this new part of town is finished. Judge Shank and Miss Enders are heading the committee and handling the celebrations. 
Anyone wishing to take part in the pageant, please get in touch with the committee or call at the Bugle office. Toward the end of the week, a truckload of mass-produced furniture was moved into every house. Every front yard had its own climbing rose bush, two dwarf cedars and maple trees, all planted and soldered round about. Each backyard had its own mass-produced ash can, birdhouse complete with a weather vane and revolving clothesline. In fact, modern production geniuses had thought of everything. Sheets, towels, pillowcases, and a print of Whistler's mother for over every fireplace. The houses were complete and ready to be moved into. They were moved into too, and as you can see, moving in was a little more than signing a paper and hanging your hat on the mass-produced hat hanger in the hallway. Uncle Ulysses was very busy these days, attending to last-minute details. The judge and Miss Enders were working frantically on the pageant for 150-year celebration of Centerburg Progress Week. Uncle Ulysses attended to streetlights and fire plugs, and one afternoon, he met Homer on the street and asked, Have you seen Dulcie Dooner around lately? I have to make arrangements to have street signs put up in the new suburb. Have you heard, Homer? He added proudly. They're going to name one of the streets Ulysses Terrace in honor of me. Why, yes, Uncle Ulysses. I just saw Dulcie coming out of the cigar store across the street. Uncle Ulysses and Homer hurried back to catch Dulcie Dooner, the town's street sign put her upper. Hi there, Dulcie, shouted Uncle Ulysses. I'd like to discuss a matter of business with you. Street signs, street signs for our new suburb. Well, Dulcie Dooner turned around and said, well, hi, Ulysses. Hi, Homer. I've been hearing about this new part of town coming up. Well, it's a great thing for Centerburg, said Uncle Ulysses. We'll need about 70 street signs, Dulcie. The signs are all made and they can be fastened to the corner lamp posts. We'll pay a dollar a sign to have you put them up. Well, said Dulcie, that's only $70 and I'm not so sure that the street sign putter uppers union would agree to that. But Dulcie, there are almost 30 other signs to put up too. That makes $100. The union surely wouldn't object to that. Yes, said Dulcie, I know but I can't fasten the signs onto the corner street lamps because the street sign putter uppers union rules say that any street sign put up by a brother of this here union must be fastened to a post erected by a brother of this here union and set in a post hole dug by a brother of this here union. Why the complete union rate is $10 a street sign for the whole post and sign. But we don't need another post on each corner. The lamp post will do very well, said Uncle Ulysses, growing frantic. Couldn't you arbitrate or something, suggested Homer? Yes, agreed Uncle Ulysses. I'll write to the president of your union and ask him. Well, Ulysses, said Uncle Dulcie, proudly, I am the president of the street sign putter-uppers union. I am the secretary treasurer, too. You see, Ulysses, I make all the union rules. I pay all the dues, and I collect them, too, so what I say goes. But certainly, you must have up-and-coming ideas like the rest of the citizens of Centerburg. There must be some compromise. Say, $5 a sign? Nope, said Dulcie firmly. It's $10 or nothing. You see, street sign putter-upping is a seasonal occupation, and I can't run the union on five bucks a sign. Well, sighed Uncle Ulysses. I guess we'll have to make other arrangements then. Well, if you make other arrangements, then the union will have to pick at your new part of town, said Dulcie. Uncle Ulysses began to get mad. Homer hadn't seen him so upset since the night the donut machine wouldn't stop making donuts. He shouted something about Dulcie being a wrench in the wheels of progress. But Dulcie just repeated, $10 a piece or I strike. Well, Homer had to rush off before the argument was finished because tonight, Friday, was the dress rehearsal for the pageant. Homer and Freddie and a couple of their friends were taking the part of Indians. They were going to be powdered all over with cocoa, striped with mercurial chrome, and draped with towels around their middles. Homer had to get to the rehearsal right on the dot because he started the pageant by rubbing two sticks together to make a fire. Most of the pageant was historical, all about Ezekiel Enders and the founding of Centerburg. The organist of the African Baptist Church wrote the words and music for a long choral work, which the choir was going to sing all the while the pageant was being acted. The rehearsal went very well. 
the choir was in a good voice, and the citizens taking the parts of Ezekiel Enders and the early settlers performed just right. So did Homer and Freddy and the boys, except for their scalping scene, which had to be modified somewhat. The grand 150 years of Centerburg Progress Week was drawing near. Meanwhile, every one of the hundred houses had been rented to a new deserving family. Homer hadn't seen Uncle Ulysses in the past two days, but he knew he must be having his troubles. For one thing, the street signs hadn't been put up. As all of the streets looked alike, this caused some slight confusion to the deserving tenants. The fact that all of the hundred houses looked alike, as a hundred donuts looked alike, added to this slight confusion. However, the deserving tenants soon found that by counting houses from the Enders homestead, they could find their way home without too much trouble. Freddie's aunt was one of the deserving tenants, and when Freddie and Homer called on her, they had to count three houses down from the Enders homestead, and then six houses to the left, and then the next house on the right was Freddie's aunt's. It was sort of a game, Freddie said to Homer. Miss Enders was proud as punch of her suburb. She decided to call it Enders Heights, even though it was as flat as a board. It's marvelous, she said, simply marvelous. The only thing she wasn't happy about was that her house, the home said, now seemed out of place, sitting as it did in the middle of Enders Heights. Uncle Ulysses and the judge agreed that the homestead did stand out like a sore thumb. They decided that the best thing to do was to move it away and build another house there. It would have to be done quickly so as to be complete by the time the pageant started that night. Uncle Ulysses, late that day, finally ironed out his difficulty with Dulcie Dooner. Dulcie, for $10 a sign and a slight increase for overtime and having to miss the pageant, agreed to have all the signs up by the time the pageant ended that night. By eight o'clock, the town square was crowded. Everyone was there to celebrate the 150 years of Centerburg Progress Week. Promptly at 8.15, Homer, as an Indian, started rubbing his sticks together to make a fire. After the fire was lighted, Homer, Freddy, and the other Indians left the stage. The judge was commentator, and while the pageant was being acted in pantomime, he'd read from the history of Enders County. The African Baptist choir chanted in the background, Ezekiel Enders, boomed the judge, set foot on American soil, owning but two shillings, an extra shirt, and a formula for making a cough syrup and an elixir of life compound that had been handed down in the Enders family for years and years. Soon after arriving, he took himself a wife and soon was the father of a child. The judge looked up from his text and said, this child was destined to be the grandfather of our own dear public spirited citizen, Miss Naomi Enders. And there was loud applause. The judge continued, hearing of the fertile lands to the west Ezekiel Enders packed his beloved wife and son and his formula into a covered wagon and with a few brave followers started toward the west, the land of plenty. Trouble seemed to follow Ezekiel and his brave little band. Their food ran out, game was scarce, and one day they found themselves in the wilderness with no food to sustain life. It was on that day, 150 years